Western mysticism has developed several different ways of dealing with the paradoxical aspects of reality. Whereas they are bypassed in Hinduism through the use of mythical language, Buddhism and Taoism tend to emphasize the paradoxes rather than conceal them. The main Taoist scripture, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, is written in an extremely puzzling, seemingly illogical style. It is full of intriguing contradictions, and its compact, powerful, and extremely poetic language is meant to arrest the reader's mind and throw it off its familiar tracks of logical reasoning. Zen Buddhists have a particular knack for making a virtue out of the inconsistencies arising from verbal communication. And with the koan system, they have developed a unique way of transmitting their teachings completely non-verbally. Koans are meant to make the student of Zen realize the limitations of logic and reasoning in the most dramatic way. The irrational wording and paradoxical content of these riddles makes it impossible to solve them by thinking. They are designed precisely to stop the thought process and thus to make the student ready for the non-verbal experience of reality. Perhaps the best known of these is the classic, you can make the sound of two hands clapping. Now what is the sound of one hand? All these koans have more or less unique solutions which a competent master recognizes immediately. Once the solution is found, the koan ceases to be paradoxical and becomes a profoundly meaningful statement made from the state of consciousness which it has helped to awaken. Here we find a striking parallel to the paradoxical situations which confronted physicists at the beginning of atomic physics. As in Zen, the truth was hidden in paradoxes that could not be solved by logical reasoning, but had to be understood in the terms of a new awareness the awareness of the atomic reality. The teacher here, of course, was nature, who, like the Zen masters, does not provide any statements. She just provides the riddles. The solving of a koan demands a supreme effort of concentration and involvement from the student. In books about Zen, we read that the koan grips the student's heart and mind and creates a true mental impasse a state of sustained tension in which the whole world becomes an enormous mass of doubt and questioning. The founders of quantum theory experienced exactly the same situation, described most vividly by Heisenberg. Quote, I remember discussions with Bohr, which went through many hours till very late at night and ended almost in despair. And when, at the end of the discussion, I went along for a walk in the neighboring park, I repeated to myself again and again the question, can nature possibly be so absurd as it seemed to us in these atomic experiments? Unquote. Whenever the essential nature of things is analyzed by the intellect, it must seem absurd or paradoxical. This has always been recognized by the mystics, but has become a problem in science only very recently. For centuries, Scientists were searching for the fundamental laws of nature underlying the great variety of natural phenomena. These phenomena belong to the scientists' macroscopic environment and thus to the realm of their sensory experience. Since the images and intellectual concepts of their language were abstracted from this very experience, they were sufficient and adequate to describe the natural phenomena. Questions about the essential nature of things were answered in classical physics by the Newtonian mechanistic model of the universe, which reduced all phenomena to the motions and interactions of hard, indestructible atoms. The properties of these atoms were abstracted from the macroscopic notion of billiard balls and thus from sensory experience. Whether this notion could actually be applied to the world of atoms was not questioned, Indeed, it could not be investigated experimentally. In the 20th century, however, physicists were able to tackle the question about the ultimate nature of matter experimentally. With the help of a most sophisticated technology, they were able to probe deeper and deeper into nature, uncovering one layer of matter after the other in search for its ultimate building blocks. 
Thus, the existence of atoms was verified. Then their constituents were discovered, the nuclei and electrons. And finally, the components of the nucleus, the protons and neutrons, and many other subatomic particles. The delicate and complicated instruments of modern experimental physics penetrate deep into the sub-microscopic world, into realms of nature far removed from our macroscopic environment, and make this world accessible to our senses. However, they can do so only through a chain of processes ending, for example, in the audible click of a Geiger counter, or in a dark spot on a photographic plate. What we see or hear are never the investigated phenomena themselves, but always their consequences. The atomic and subatomic world itself lies beyond our sensory perception. It is then with the help of modern instrumentation that we are able to observe the properties of atoms and their constituents in an indirect way, and thus to experience the subatomic world to some extent. This experience, however, is not an ordinary one comparable to that of our daily environment. The knowledge about matter at this level is no longer derived from direct sensory experience, and therefore our ordinary language, which takes its images from the world of the senses, is no longer adequate to describe the observed phenomena. As we penetrate deeper and deeper into nature, we have to abandon more and more the images and concepts of ordinary language. On this journey to the world of the infinitely small, the most important step, from a philosophical point of view, was the first one, the step into the world of atoms. Probing inside the atom and investigating its structure, science transcended the limits of our sensory imagination. From this point on, it could no longer rely with absolute certainty on logic and common sense. Atomic physics provided the scientists with the first glimpses of the essential nature of things. Like the mystics, physicists were now dealing with a non-sensory experience of reality, and like the mystics, they had to face the paradoxical aspects of this experience. From then on, therefore, the models and images of modern physics became akin to those of Eastern philosophy. According to the Eastern mystics, the direct mystical experience of reality is a momentous event which shakes the very foundations of one's world view. The Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki has called it, quote, the most startling event that could ever happen in the realm of human consciousness, upsetting every form of standardized experience, unquote. He has illustrated the shocking character of this experience with the words of a Zen master who described it as the bottom of a pail breaking through. At the beginning of this century, physicists felt much the same way when the foundations of their worldview were shaken by the new experience of the atomic reality. They described this experience in terms which were often very similar to those used by Suzuki's Zen master. Thus, to quote Werner Heisenberg, the violent reaction on the recent development of modern physics can only be understood when one realizes that here the foundations of physics have started moving, and that this motion has caused the feeling that the ground would be cut from science." Unquote. Einstein experienced the same shock when he first came in contact with the new reality of atomic physics. He wrote in his autobiography, quote, all my attempts to adapt the theoretical foundation of physics to this new type of knowledge failed completely. It was as if the ground had been pulled out from under one with no firm foundation to be seen anywhere upon which one could have built." Unquote. The discoveries of modern physics necessitated profound changes of concepts like space, time, matter, object, cause and effect, etc. 
And since these concepts are so basic to our way of experiencing the world, it is not surprising that the physicists who were forced to change them felt something of a shock. Out of these changes emerged a new and radically different worldview, still in the process of formation by current scientific research. It seems, then, that Eastern mystics and Western physicists went through similar revolutionary experiences which led them to completely new ways of seeing the world. The worldview which was changed by the discoveries of modern physics had been based on Newton's mechanical model of the universe. This model constituted the solid framework of classical physics. It was indeed a most formidable foundation supporting, like a mighty rock, all of science and providing a firm basis for natural philosophy for almost three centuries. The stage of the Newtonian universe on which all physical phenomena took place was the three-dimensional space of classical Euclidean geometry. It was an absolute space, always at rest and unchangeable. In Newton's own words, quote, absolute space in its own nature, without regard to anything external, remains always similar and immovable, unquote. All changes in the physical world were described in terms of a separate dimension called time, which again was absolute, having no connection with the material world and flowing smoothly from the past through the present to the future. As Newton further said, quote, absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and by its own nature flows uniformly without regard to anything external. Unquote. The elements of the Newtonian world which moved in this absolute space and absolute time were material particles. In the mathematical equations, they were treated as mass points, and Newton saw them as small, solid, and indestructible objects out of which all matter was made. Newtonian atomism includes a precise description of the force acting between the material particles. This force is very simple, depending only on the masses and the mutual distances of the particles. It is the force of gravity, and it was seen by Newton as rigidly connected with the bodies it acted upon and as acting instantaneously over a distance. In Newtonian mechanics, all physical events are reduced to the motion of material points in space caused by their mutual attraction, that is, by the force of gravity. In order to put the effect of this force on a mass point into a precise mathematical form, Newton had to invent completely new concepts and mathematical techniques, those of differential calculus. This was a tremendous intellectual achievement and has been praised by Einstein as, quote, perhaps the greatest advance in thought that a single individual was ever privileged to make, unquote. The mechanistic view of nature is closely related to a rigorous determinism. The giant cosmic machine was seen as being completely causal and determinate. All that happened had a definite cause and gave rise to a definite effect, and the future of any part of the system could, in principle, be predicted with absolute certainty if its state at any time was known in all details. Newton himself applied his theory to the movement of the planets and was able to explain the basic features of the solar system. However, his planetary model was greatly simplified, neglecting, for example, the gravitational influence of the planets on each other. Thus, he found that there were certain irregularities which he could not explain. He resolved this problem by assuming that God was always present in the universe to correct these irregularities. The 18th and 19th centuries witnessed a tremendous success of Newtonian mechanics. Physicists of that period believed that the universe was indeed a huge mechanical system running according to the Newtonian laws of motion. These laws were seen as the basic laws of nature, and Newton's mechanics was considered to be the ultimate theory of natural phenomena. And yet, it was less than a hundred years later that a new physical reality was discovered which made the limitations of the Newtonian model apparent 
and showed that none of its features had absolute validity. This realization did not come abruptly, but was initiated by developments that had already started in the 19th century and prepared the way for the scientific revolutions of our time. The first of these developments was the discovery and investigation of electric and magnetic phenomena which could not be described appropriately by the mechanistic model and involved a new type of force. The important step was made by one of the greatest experimenters in the history of science, Michael Faraday, and a brilliant theorist, Clerk Maxwell. When Faraday produced an electric current in a coil of copper by moving a magnet near it, and thus converted the mechanical work of moving the magnet into electric energy, he brought science and technology to a turning point. On the one hand, his fundamental experiment gave birth to the vast technology of electrical engineering. On the other hand, it formed the basis of his and Maxwell's theoretical speculations, which eventually resulted in a complete theory of electromagnetism. Faraday and Maxwell did not only study the effects of the electric and magnetic forces, but made the forces themselves the primary object of their investigation. They replaced the concept of a force by that of a force field, and in doing so they were the first to go beyond Newtonian physics. This was a most profound change in our conception of physical reality. In the Newtonian view, the forces are rigidly connected with the bodies they act upon. Now the force concept was replaced by the much subtler concept of a field, which had its own reality and could be studied without any reference to material bodies. The culmination of this theory, called electrodynamics, was the realization that light is nothing but a rapidly alternating electromagnetic field traveling through space in the form of waves. Today we know that radio waves, light waves, and x-rays are all electromagnetic waves, oscillating electric and magnetic fields differing only in the frequency of their oscillation. We know, too, that visible light is only a tiny fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. At the beginning of the 20th century, then, physicists had two successful theories which applied to different phenomena, Newton's mechanics and Maxwell's electrodynamics. The Newtonian model had ceased to be the basis of all physics. The first three decades of our century radically changed the whole situation in physics. Two separate developments, that of relativity theory and of atomic physics, shattered all the principal concepts of the Newtonian worldview, such as the notion of absolute space and time, the elementary solid particles, the strictly causal nature of physical phenomena, and the ideal of an objective description of nature. None of these concepts could be extended to the new domains into which physics was now penetrating. At the beginning of modern physics stands the extraordinary intellectual feat of one man, Albert Einstein. In two articles, both published in 1905, Einstein initiated two revolutionary trends of thought. One was his special theory of relativity. The other was a new way of looking at electromagnetic radiation which was to become characteristic of quantum theory, the theory of atomic phenomena. The complete quantum theory was worked out 20 years later by a whole team of physicists. Relativity theory, however, was constructed in its complete form almost entirely by Einstein himself. Einstein's scientific papers stand at the beginning of the 20th century as imposing intellectual monuments the pyramids of modern civilization. Einstein strongly believed in nature's inherent harmony, and his deepest concern throughout his scientific life was to find a unified foundation of physics. He began to move toward this goal by constructing a common framework for electrodynamics and mechanics, the two separate theories of classical physics. This framework is known as the special theory of relativity. It unified and completed the structure of classical physics. But at the same time, 
It involved drastic changes in the traditional concepts of space and time and undermined one of the foundations of the Newtonian worldview. According to relativity theory, space is not three-dimensional and time is not a separate entity. Both are intimately connected and form a four-dimensional continuum, space-time. In relativity theory, therefore, we can never talk about space without talking about time and vice versa. Furthermore, there is no universal flow of time as in the Newtonian model. Different observers will order events differently in time if they move with different velocities relative to the observed events. In such a case, two events which are seen as occurring simultaneously by one observer may occur in different temporal sequences for other observers. All measurements involving space and time thus lose their absolute significance. In relativity theory, the Newtonian concept of an absolute space as the stage of physical phenomena is abandoned, and so is the concept of an absolute time. Both space and time become merely elements of the language a particular observer uses for describing the observed phenomena. The concepts of space and time are so basic for the description of natural phenomena that their modification entails a modification of the whole framework that we use to describe nature. The most important consequence of this modification is the realization that mass is nothing but a form of energy. Even an object at rest has energy stored in its mass, and the relation between the two is given by the famous equation E equals mc squared, where E is energy, m is the mass of the object, and c is the speed of light. So far, we've been speaking of the special theory of relativity. In 1915, Einstein proposed his general theory of relativity, in which the framework of the special theory is extended to include gravity that is, the mutual attraction or gravitational field of all massive bodies. The force of gravity, according to Einstein's theory, has the effect of curving space and time. This means that ordinary Euclidean geometry is no longer valid in such a curved space, just as the two-dimensional geometry of a flat surface cannot be applied on the surface of a sphere. Wherever there is a massive object, for example, a star or a planet, the space around it is curved, and the degree of curvature depends on the mass of the object. And as space can never be separated from time in relativity theory, time as well is affected by the presence of matter, flowing at different rates in different parts of the universe. Einstein's general theory of relativity thus completely abolishes the concepts of absolute space and time. Not only are all measurements involving space and time relative, the whole structure of space-time depends on the distribution of matter in the universe, and the concept of empty space loses its meaning. The mechanistic worldview of classical physics was based on the notion of solid bodies moving in empty space. This notion is still valid in the region that has been called the zone of middle dimensions that is, in the realm of our daily experience where classical physics continues to be a useful theory. Both concepts, that of empty space and that of solid material bodies, are deeply ingrained in our habits of thought. It is extremely difficult for us to imagine a physical reality where they do not apply. And yet, this is precisely what modern physics forces us to do when we go beyond the middle dimensions. Empty space has lost its meaning in astrophysics and cosmology, the sciences of the universe at large, and the concept of solid objects was shattered by atomic physics, the science of the infinitely small. At the turn of the century, several phenomena were discovered connected with the structure of atoms and inexplicable in terms of classical physics. The first indication that atoms had some structure came from the discovery of X-rays, a new radiation which rapidly found its now well-known application in medicine. However, 
X-rays are not the only radiation emitted by atoms. Soon after their discovery, other kinds of radiation were discovered, which are emitted by the atoms of so-called radioactive substances. The phenomenon of radioactivity gave definite proof of the composite nature of atoms, showing that the atoms of radioactive substances not only emit various types of radiation, but also transform themselves into atoms of completely different substances. Besides being objects of intense study, these phenomena were also used in most ingenious ways as new tools to probe deeper into matter than had ever been possible before. Thus, Max von Laue used X-rays to study the arrangements of atoms in crystals. Ernest Rutherford realized that the so-called alpha particles emanating from radioactive substances were high-speed projectiles of subatomic size, which could be used to explore the interior of the atom. They could be fired at atoms, and from the way they were deflected, one could draw conclusions about the atom's structure. When Rutherford bombarded atoms with these alpha particles, he obtained sensational and totally unexpected results. Far from being the hard and solid particles they were believed to be since antiquity, the atoms turned out to consist of vast regions of space in which extremely small particles, the electrons, moved around the nucleus bound to it by electric forces. It is not easy to get a feeling for the order of magnitude of atoms. It is so far removed from our macroscopic scale. The diameter of an atom is about one hundred millionth of a centimeter. In order to visualize this diminutive size, imagine an orange blown up to the size of the Earth. The atoms of the orange will then have the size of cherries myriads of cherries tightly packed into a globe of the size of the earth. That's a magnified picture of the atoms in an orange. An atom, therefore, is extremely small compared to macroscopic objects, but it is huge compared to the nucleus in its center. In our picture of cherry-sized atoms, the nucleus of an atom will be so small that we will not be able to see it. If we blew up the atom to the size of a football, or even to room size, the nucleus would still be too small to be seen by the naked eye. To see the nucleus, we would have to blow up the atom to the size of the biggest dome in the world, the dome of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. In an atom of that size, the nucleus would have the size of a grain of salt a grain of salt in the middle of the dome of St. Peter's and specks of dust whirling around it in the vast space of the dome. This is how we can picture the nucleus and electrons of an atom. The concepts of quantum theory were not easy to accept even after their mathematical formulation had been completed. Their effect on the physicist's imagination was truly shattering. Rutherford's experiments had shown that atoms, instead of being hard and indestructible, consisted of vast regions of space in which extremely small particles moved. Now quantum theory made it clear that even these particles were nothing like the solid objects of classical physics. The subatomic units of matter are very abstract entities which have a dual aspect. Depending on how we look at them, they appear sometimes as particles, sometimes as waves. As previously mentioned, this dual nature is also exhibited by light, which can take the form of electromagnetic waves or of particles. This property of matter and of light is very strange. It seems impossible to accept that something can be, at the same time, a particle, that is, an entity confined to a very small volume, and a wave which is spread out over a large region of space. This contradiction gave rise to most of the koan-like paradoxes which finally led to the formulation of quantum theory. The whole development started when Max Planck discovered that the energy of heat radiation is not emitted continuously, but appears in the form of energy packets. Einstein called these energy packets quanta, and recognized them as a fundamental aspect of nature.
he was bold enough to postulate that light and every other form of electromagnetic radiation can appear not only as electromagnetic waves, but also in the form of these quanta. The light quanta, which gave quantum theory its name, have since been accepted as bona fide particles and are now called photons. They are particles of a special kind, however, massless and always traveling with the speed of light. The apparent contradiction between the particle and the wave picture was solved in a completely unexpected way, which called into question the very foundation of the mechanistic worldview, the concept of the reality of matter. At the subatomic level, matter does not exist with certainty at definite places, but rather shows tendencies to exist. Atomic events do not occur with certainty at definite times and in definite ways, but rather show tendencies to occur. In the formation of quantum theory, these tendencies are expressed as probabilities and are associated with mathematical quantities which take the form of waves. This is why particles can be waves at the same time. They are not real three-dimensional waves like sound or water waves. They are probability waves, abstract mathematical quantities with all the characteristic properties of waves, which are related to the probabilities of finding the particles at particular points in space and at particular times. All the laws of atomic physics are expressed in terms of these probabilities. We can never predict an atomic event with certainty. We can only say how likely it is to happen. Quantum theory has thus demolished the classical concepts of solid objects and of strictly deterministic laws of nature. At the subatomic level, the solid material objects of classical physics dissolve into wave-like patterns of probabilities. Ultimately, these patterns do not represent probabilities of things, but rather probabilities of interconnections. A careful analysis of the process of observation in atomic physics has shown that the subatomic particles have no meaning as isolated entities, but can only be understood as interconnections between the preparation of an experiment and the subsequent measurement. Quantum theory thus reveals a basic oneness of the universe. It shows that we cannot decompose the world into independently existing smallest units. As we penetrate into matter, nature does not show us any isolated basic building blocks, but rather appears as a complicated web of relations between the various parts of the whole. These relations always include the observer in an essential way. The human observer constitutes the final link in the chain of observational processes, and the properties of any atomic object can only be understood in terms of the object's interaction with the observer. This means that the classical ideal of an objective description of nature is no longer valid. The Cartesian partition between the eye and the world, between the observer and the observed, cannot be made when dealing with atomic matter. In atomic physics, we can never speak about nature without, at the same time, speaking about ourselves. The first important step towards an understanding of nuclear structure was the discovery of the second constituent of the nucleus, the neutron, a particle which has roughly the same mass as the first nuclear constituent, the proton. The neutron has about 2,000 times the mass of the electron, but does not carry an electric charge. This discovery not only explained how the nuclei of all chemical elements were built up from protons and neutrons, but also revealed that the nuclear force, which kept these particles so tightly bound within the nucleus, was a completely new phenomenon. It could not be of electromagnetic origin, since the neutrons were electrically neutral. Physicists soon realized 
that they were here confronted with a new force of nature which does not manifest itself anywhere outside the nucleus. An atomic nucleus is about 100,000 times smaller than the whole atom, yet it contains almost all of the atom's mass. This means that matter inside the nucleus must be extremely dense compared to the forms of matter we're used to. Indeed, if the whole human body were compressed to nuclear density, it would not take up more space than a pinhead. This high density, however, is not the only unusual property of nuclear matter. Being of the same quantum nature as electrons, the nucleons, as the protons and neutrons are often called, respond to their confinement with high velocities. And since they are squeezed into a much smaller volume, their reaction is all the more violent. They race about in the nucleus with velocities of about 40,000 miles per second. Nuclear matter is thus a form of matter entirely different from anything we experience up here in our macroscopic environment. We can perhaps picture it best as tiny drops of an extremely dense liquid which is boiling and bubbling most fiercely. The picture of matter which emerges from the study of atoms and nuclei shows that most of it is concentrated in tiny drops separated by huge distances. In the vast space between the massive and fiercely boiling nuclear drops move the electrons. These constitute only a tiny fraction of the total mass, but give matter its solid aspect and provide the links necessary to build up the molecular structures. They are also involved in chemical reactions and are responsible for the chemical properties of matter. Relativity theory has had a profound influence on our picture of matter by forcing us to modify our concept of a particle in an essential way. In classical physics, the mass of an object had always been associated with an indestructible material substance, with some stuff of which all things were thought to be made. Relativity theory showed that mass has nothing to do with any substance, but is a form of energy. Energy, however, is a dynamic quantity associated with activity or with processes. The fact that the mass of a particle is equivalent to a certain amount of energy means that the particle can no longer be seen as a static object, but has to be conceived as a dynamic pattern, a process involving the energy which manifests itself as the particle's mass. The creation of material particles from pure energy is certainly the most spectacular effect of relativity theory. When two particles collide with high energies, they generally break into pieces. But these pieces are not smaller than the original particles. They are again particles of the same kind and are created out of the energy of motion, or kinetic energy, involved in the collision process. The whole problem of dividing matter is thus resolved in an unexpected sense. The only way to divide subatomic particles further is to bang them together in collision processes involving high energies. This way we can divide matter again and again, but we never obtain smaller pieces because we just create particles out of the energy involved in the process. The subatomic particles are thus destructible and indestructible at the same time. This state of affairs is bound to remain paradoxical as long as we adopt the static view of composite objects consisting of basic building blocks. Only when the dynamic, relativistic view is adopted does the paradox disappear. The particles are then seen as dynamic patterns or processes which involve a certain amount of energy appearing to us as their mass. In a collision process, the energy of the two colliding particles is redistributed to form a new pattern. And if it has been increased by a sufficient amount of kinetic energy, this new pattern may involve additional particles. High energy collisions of subatomic particles are the principal method used by physicists to study the properties of these particles. And particle physics is therefore also called high energy physics. The kinetic energies required for the collision experiments are achieved by means of huge particle accelerators, enormous circular machines with circumferences of several miles, 
in which protons are accelerated to velocities near the speed of light and are then made to collide with other protons or with neutrons. It is impressive that machines of that size are needed to study the world of the infinitely small. They are the super microscopes of our time. The high energy scattering experiments of the past decades have shown us the dynamic and ever-changing nature of the particle world in the most striking way. Matter has appeared in these experiments as completely mutable. All particles can be transmuted into other particles. They can be created from energy and can vanish into energy. In this world, classical concepts like elementary particle, space, time, material substance, or isolated object have lost their meaning. The whole universe appears as a dynamic web of inseparable energy patterns. So far, we have not yet found a complete theory to describe this world of subatomic particles. But we do have several theoretical models which describe certain aspects of it very well. None of these models is free from mathematical difficulties, and they all contradict each other in certain ways. But all of them reflect the basic unity and the intrinsically dynamic character of matter. They show that the properties of a particle can only be understood in terms of its activity, of its interaction with the surrounding environment, and that the particle, therefore, cannot be seen as an isolated entity. It has to be understood as an integrated part of the whole. Let us now turn aside from the world of physics for a few moments to describe somewhat more fully the schools of Eastern thought we have been and will be referring to in this program. There are the various schools in the religious philosophies of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. And we'd like to briefly outline some of the aspects and concepts of these spiritual traditions that directly relate to our comparison with physics. For an understanding of any of these philosophies, it is important to realize that they are religious in essence. Their main aim is the direct mystical experience of reality. And since this experience is religious by nature, they are inseparable from religion. More than for any other Eastern tradition, this is true for Hinduism, where the connection between philosophy and religion is particularly strong. It has been said that almost all thought in India is, in a sense, religious thought. Hinduism has not only influenced throughout many centuries India's intellectual life, but almost completely determined her social and cultural life as well. The basis of all Hinduism is the idea that the multitude of things and events around us are but different manifestations of the same ultimate reality. This reality, called Brahman, is the unifying concept which gives Hinduism its essentially monistic nature in spite of the worship of numerous gods and goddesses. Brahman, the ultimate reality, is understood as the soul or inner essence of all things. It is infinite and beyond all concepts. It cannot be comprehended by the intellect, nor can it be adequately described in words. Quote, Brahman, beginningness, supreme, beyond what is and beyond what is not. Incomprehensible is that supreme soul, unlimited, unborn, not to be reasoned about, unthinkable." Unquote. The basic recurring theme in Hindu mythology is the creation of the world by the self-sacrifice of God. Sacrifice in the original sense of making sacred, whereby God becomes the world, which in the end becomes again God. This creative activity of the divine is called Leela, the play of God, and the world is seen as the stage of the divine play. Like most of Hindu mythology, the myth of Leela has a strong magical flavor. Brahman is the great magician who transforms himself into the world, and he performs this feat with his magic creative power, which is the original meaning of Maya in the Rig Veda. The word Maya, one of the most important terms in Indian philosophy, has changed its meaning over the centuries. From the might 
or power of the divine actor and magician, it came to signify the psychological state of anybody under the spell of the magic play. As long as we confuse the myriad forms of the divine Leela with reality, without perceiving the unity of Brahman underlying all these forms, we are under the spell of Maya. Maya, therefore, does not mean that the world is an illusion, as is often wrongly stated. The illusion merely lies in our point of view. If we think that the shapes and structures, things and events around us are realities of nature, instead of realizing that they are concepts of our measuring and categorizing minds. Maya is the illusion of taking these concepts for reality, of confusing the map with the territory. In the Hindu view of nature, then, all forms are relative, fluid, and ever-changing Maya, conjured up by the great magician of the divine play. The world of Maya changes continuously because the divine Leela is a rhythmic, dynamic play. The dynamic force of the play is karma, another important concept of Indian thought. Karma means action. It is the active principle of the play, the total universe in action, where everything is dynamically connected with everything else. In the words of the beautiful spiritual poem of the Bhagavad Gita, Karma is the force of creation wherefrom all things have their life. To be free from the spell of Maya, to break the bonds of karma, means to realize that all the phenomena we perceive with our senses are part of the same reality. It means to experience, concretely and personally, that everything, including our own self, is Brahman. This experience is called moksha, or liberation, in Hindu philosophy, and it is the very essence of Hinduism. Mm -hmm.